Hey guys, today we're going to be working on faces. This video is going to be talking about proportions for faces when you look at them dead on from the front. Uh, proportions that make a face look more masculine, more feminine, older, younger. The next video uh, is going to talk about proportions and features when the face is three quarter profile, one quarter, you know, when you barely see like, you know, this much of the face and mostly ear. And then uh, future videos is going to talk about how to illustrate faces with or without makeup. Let's get started. So just so you guys can see clearly, I'm going to draw much larger than croaky size right now. But I'm going to start with an upside down egg. I'm going to do a man's face and a woman's face. But they each start with an upside down egg. Split them in half, this way and this way. This center line, this horizontal center line, is going to be your eye line. Your eyes sit on the middle of your head, not the middle of your face, but the middle of your head. And if you want your figure to look a little bit younger, you can drop your eyes a little bit because the closer your features are to each other, the younger you look. If you look at the classic Gerber baby or just any babies, all their features are here and then they have a massive forehead, just so much head, right? And then as they get older, their features start spreading. On the flip side of that, if you want a customer that, or muse that looks a little bit more older, sophisticated, mature, you want to take their eyes and just move it up a hair and so that their face looks a little bit longer and, you know, you'll get a more elegant, mature look like Angelica Houston, Daphne Guinness, like those kinds of women, right? So the center will be kind of your average, youngish, adult, a little higher for older, little lower for teen, tween, maybe more just like a cutesier look. Now the proportions horizontally is you want an eye width in between your eyes, minimum. If you are going for that younger cutesier look, you can space them apart a little bit more but you need at least one eye width in between or they really look start looking cross-eyed or pinched. So it's one eye, one eye, one eye. And then on either side you want about half an eye. So I'm gonna space them apart like this. Okay. So this is one eye here. This is one eye here. One eye, one eye, one eye, half an eye, half an eye, right? And the same with your men, right? One eye, one eye, half eye, one eye, half eye, like so. When you create your eye features, you know, you can start with your classic football shape. And to give it a more realistic eye, I would flatten here, flatten here. Add your tear duct, add your eye crease so that you have an eye that looks more. You don't want eyelashes to stick straight up like spider legs, but you want the curl happening. can put as many eyelashes as you want, but you definitely want them to look like they're curling and more fluttery. For, you know, all the stuff, the iris, the pupil, and whatnot, you don't want it to be this round piece in the middle. She's going to look super startled. That's always super fun. Not really. You want more of a U shape in here. And then your, your pupils in here. You know, 
if you have a really close up eye, you can do things like bottom lashes and putting in your pupil. When you get, when you start drawing your teeny tiny croaky eyes, you're probably not going to have room for that. For guys, you know, the basics are the same. Typically, I don't draw a lot of eyelashes on guys. Like sometimes I'll do a little guy liner, but I won't do big fluttery lashes. Even though in real life, I know lots of guys with really beautiful, gorgeous, fluttery lashes. It's one of those things that really starts feminizing an illustration too much. So with the guy, you know, I start with that same football and the smooshing here and the smooshing here and the adding the tear ducts. But I tend to draw men a little bit more angular and more square and with slightly smaller eyes like you know they're kind of like squinting a little bit because i guess that's cool i don't know it's fashion and yeah right now i'm not really concerned with how beautiful i'm making these features because it's really i'm just trying to show you basic placement right now I promise it's going to look cooler in a second. I mean, obviously, you can also do a monolid. I'm a monolid. I don't have that crease in my eyelid. Now, for the top half of the woman's head, you want to break it up into thirds. This top third is going to be where her hairline is. And, you know, hair kind of grows out. You never want a hairline that's super crisp and perfect unless you're talking about a black person with a really tight fade. Like they have the really crisp hairlines. I mean, they go to, a, you know, the barber of their choice to make sure that they're getting that perfect line. But, you know, the rest of us, our hair grows. We have irregular hairlines and that's normal and natural. That's just how our hair grows. So it grows up and out like so. Now this top, this bottom third, that's gonna be your eyebrow space. So your eyebrows can sit a little bit lower than this line, but they can never go higher unless you're starting to develop characters where they look more like Cruella de Vil. So your eyebrows should, the top of your eyebrows should be no higher than this line. You know, they should be close to symmetrical. You're never going to get perfectly symmetrical, and that's okay because, you know, human faces aren't symmetrical, but you should get close to it. Although I did have one student who told me, Zoe, eyebrows aren't twins, but they're sisters. <laughs> so I guess that was her way of saying that, like, a little symmet asymmetry is okay. So we're going to put our eyebrows in here like this. But when you draw her features... Keep in mind that you're not going to just give me a block of eyebrow. You're going to fill that in with actual hairs because eyebrows are made out of hairs. And when I render faces, I do eyebrows with the color pencil so that I can have that hairy texture happening so that they look like real eyebrows. And, you know, eyebrow fads come and go sometimes. Right now we're doing, like, thicker brows coming off of, like, the whole Cara Delevingne super thick brows thing. And, you know, there have been periods of time, like, in the 20s when you had the super skinny Marlena Dietrich Clara Bow brow. But never, ever, ever give me a sperm brow. This is a sperm brow. You know, when you have that super tight, big knot, and then you get that sperm brow is never attractive. With guys, I break this up into quarters. This top quarter is where this guy's hairline is. Okay, let's say he's got a pompadour going. That's where his hairline is starting. And then this is where his eyebrows start. So, you know, a lot of guys, they don't pluck as much as women do. Now, the bottom half of the face, 
again, I would cut it into thirds again. And this is about where the nose stops. So like here, her nostrils are here. Like so. For the man, I would cut it in half and that's where his nose ends. A little bit longer on the dude, a little bit broader, a little bit more significant. Sometimes I like to give him a little bump on the ridge. For the mouth, erase that mark. And in this remaining space, again, break it up into thirds. And this top third is going to be the center of your mouth. This is going to be your middle line. And then there's your upper lip. There's your lower lip. And this third line, this is that dent right here under your mouth. And then your chin comes out like so. On men, again, we're going to break this up into thirds, and this is the center line for the mouth. I generally don't draw an upper lip for men, and this might be a great failing on my part where when I draw an upper lip on guys, they see, like, I can't seem to draw them in a way where they look really masculine. And if I want, I tend to draw an upper lip on guys when I want a more androgynous, a little bit more femme look. And then again, this is that divot in there. Ears start in between the eyebrow and the eye and end right level with the nose. So here, here, also on dudes, here. And here and then right now their, their faces are so round <laughs> and this is where I start carving into the face some so you know go in for the temple and out for the cheekbone and out for the jaw some you know depending on what kind of shape you wanted to give them you want to give them a little heart shape or make them you know a little bit more cutesy and round with rounded cheeks you know if you want them to look super femme you know maybe a little perky little pointy chin and like rounder cheeks if you want them to look a little bit more sophisticated you want to like angle the cheekbones and you know make this cheekbone and this jaw more prominent if you want it to look super cutesy, maybe this is just, everything is softer and rounder. For guys, you know, again, I do draw things more angular. So here's, I'm gonna give him a really square jaw and chin. And then your neck is coming out under here. And then with guys, you wanna give them an Adam's apple. So yeah, right now my faces look pretty gnarly because everything was about placement and making sure everything is placed correctly. Now I'm going to flip the page over and I'm going to redraw everything so that everything looks nice.
says male and female. And you know, the reason I showed you this process, like figuring out the proportions on the back and then redrawing the features in a prettier way in the front, is this is a really good learning process for many of you, especially if you're new to drawing faces. It's really hard to try to do five new things at the same time, or even two new things at the same time. And so, you know, if you're trying to place everything properly and draw perfect features at the same time, it can be really complicated and frustrating. It's much easier to figure out where to place everything, kind of map out your features according to, you know, how old, how young, how masculine, how feminine you want your face to look, and then put in your features having the placement there to help you. Right? So if you're getting started, I would highly recommend that you first start the process with this two-step method. If you're gonna do this process, I like using marker paper because you know you can see through it, but not completely. So when you redo the drawing, the back of the paper isn't so strong that you still see a lot of it. And if you're gonna use this as a final, you can just erase the back. Or you can use tracing paper and just layer sheets of tracing paper on top, and that's fine. Or if you're gonna be working on something with painting, you know, draw something on tracing paper and then use a light box and draw on top. If I'm transferring drawings to watercolor paper, I only trace final finals. Like I've worked out all the things, all the patterns and hairstyles and everything because I hate erasing on top of watercolor paper because it really affects the texture, especially if you erase a lot. And then your paint will, you know, not work as smoothly on top. You don't want to be erasing a lot on the surface of your watercolor paper. Hot press or cold press, doesn't matter. And if these terms don't make any sense to me, I have a whole video on how to shop for paper and I'll drop a link in the comments. Other than that, that's it for proportions for full frontal faces. See you next time. Hey guys, welcome to video number two in the face series. If you have not watched video number one, it is all about front view faces and figuring out the layout of proportions to create ma uh, masculine and feminine faces, older and younger faces. So if you haven't seen that, go check that out because I will be referencing that video quite often in this one. This is video number two and we're gonna be talking about different angles. Three quarter profile one quarter angle faces let's start with profile faces so I put together these pictures and I drew these red boxes around these heads and you'll notice that uh, on average the top the distance from the top of your head to the bottom is the same as the distance from the tip of your nose to the back of your head including hair I mean, except this guy, he has no hair on the back of his head, but, okay. So when you start drawing your profile heads, start with a box. I'm gonna split it in half and then half again. And then leaving some space for the nose, I'm gonna draw an oval, much like that egg we started off with for front view faces. And then we're gonna draw another oval sideways and this is going to be the basic shape of your skull ears sit in the back half of the head it's a little bit different for everybody but it's definitely in the second half the back half of your head and it's tipped back it's not really straight up and down do you remember these proportions of course you do because you watched the first video the vertical proportions in the layout of your features are going to be the same because it's not like my eye, the distance between my eyes and my eyebrows got different when I turned my head. So the center line is again your eye line. Your ears start just above that line. And for women, the top is split into thirds and so this is your hairline again. That's where your beautiful hairline starts. And then this is the highest point that your eyebrows can hit 
without getting into Cruella de Vil territory. Remember, no sperm brows. And then again, a th breaking this up into thirds, that's where the bottom of the nose is going to sit. And then in this section, breaking this up into thirds again, that's going to be the center of the mouth. For guys, the eye line is in the center again. And then we broke this up into quarters. And so that's the top of his eyebrow and that is his hairline. Broke this into half, that's the bottom of his nose. And then we broke this up into thirds and that's the center of his mouth. With facial features, basically, we're going. I'm. You're going to. Blah, 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 you're gonna. I'm gonna. You're gonna. I'm gonna. What you want to do with facial features is take the features and cut them in half. You can't have frontal features on a side view face. Then you're gonna look like Egyptian hieroglyphics. And if you want to do that, fine. It's just gonna look weird and not particularly human. So remember that football shape that we talked about to start drawing eyes? You're gonna cut that in half. You're going to round out the edge because our eyeballs are round. And then you're gonna put in the crease and you're gonna put in some eyelashes. And then that's gonna be your iris and your pupil and all that good stuff in there. You're going to taper the edges a little bit because that's what our eyes do, right? So here we go, right in that center line. Also here. Eyebrows. You're only going to see this much eyebrow, and so you're just going to see the arch. So we're going to see just this. That's the shape that we're going to get, and the same here. Let's put in the nose. Remember, noses will go to the edge of this box. And most noses, they're turned up a little bit, and that's how you can see a little bit of nostril when you're looking at a person dead on. So don't create this kind of dead on triangle, but more like at a little angle. So we're here, we're here, your nostrils sit here, like so. Same with guys. And remember at this point, you're not super concerned with getting all the features looking beautiful. We're gonna figure out their proportions and then draw everything beautiful again. Again with the mouth, remember we started with this kind of basic shape. We're gonna cut it in half. We're going to round the edges because our lips are 3D and plump. And sometimes we're going to add a little bit of cushion in the middle there because for a lot of people, there's a little extra right there. And yeah, the because it's a side view and everything is cut in half, all your facial features should be much smaller than your front view features. So if it looks like your face is like really squished in there, that's because it is. And then we're going to bring the chin out because we're going to connect the jaw to the ear. Now, the inside of the ear, it's like a mess of swirly stuff that looks a little bit different on everybody. But what I always draw is the earlobe. What is this thing here? Like people pierce it sometimes. I don't I don't know what it's called. That little nub in there. You would think I know so much anatomy terminology that I would know what that means. What this is. But I do not. We're gonna draw that. We're gonna draw the edge of the ear, the shell. And then I always just kind of draw an extra little swirly S in there. Here's his chin, here's his jaw. I actually want to push his ear back a little bit. 
there's his neck. And then with guys, don't forget you need to put in an Adam's apple. With women, not so much. And there is your side view facial feature layout. I know, it doesn't look super attractive right now. <laughs> So let's put everything together and make sure the features are beautiful and redraw the whole shebang. I like to show this two-step method so that you guys don't feel like you have to nail everything in one step. It's like learn a little bit of this, figure these things out, and then put everything together. You guys, I have a whole series on hair, so I'm not even going to go there. I will drop a link in the info box to all of my hair videos. Go knock yourselves out. When I'm trying to make someone look more masculine, I tend to make things look more angular and less softly rounded. So I will create a harsher eyebrow ridge and a stronger nose. All right, and there are your profile faces. When you're doing the head shape for three-quarter faces, you're kind of merging the frontal view face and the profile, the depth of a profile face. So remember that egg, that upside down egg we started off with for the frontal face? You're going to cut it into quarters. And because it's a three quarter face, you are literally going to make it three quarters of the original face. And so you're going to remove this part. But remember, our skulls are deeper than wide. So you need to add a bunch of the back of this head that you're gonna see when you start swiveling the head around. So you're going to take this, three qu this quarter, you're gonna add it here. And then you're gonna add a little bit more. You're going to follow the same vertical proportions. So across, halfway. One third, one third, one third, and then one third, one third. It's gonna dip in here for the eye. And so we're gonna bring this around cheekbone and jaw. This is going to be the new center line for the face. And then remember, we're gonna add all this head. I say add, it's supposed to be there. There's no additional head. So again, this is your eye line. That's your eyebrow line. There's your hairline. So let's add our three quarter features. As you may have predicted, our three-quarter features are three-quarters the size of frontal features. <laughs> so remember our football, our good old trusty football? You're going to redraw that, and you're going to cut it into quarters. You're going to take one half, and you're going to take this shape, and you're going to squish it in half the width. 
like so. And then you're going to add your tear duct, make this flatter, make this flatter, you know, add your crease, all those things we did with the frontal eye. And yeah, this eye that's closer to us is going to be larger than this eye because it's further away. I'm going to put in the nose here. Remember, it ends here. And there's the other nostril. And your eyebrow is going to get cut off. And then your mouth, again, your basic mouth shape cut it into quarters, and then take this shape and then squish it into half the width. Add that little bit of cushion there. See how it's coming together? Wow, she's kind of ugly. Oof, we're going to fix that. And then remember, the top of the ear starts in between the eyebrow and the eye, and it's really back here in the second half I keep saying second half, like the back of the head is less important. It's totally important for your being aliveness. So back half of the head. The ear is here. And then we're going to add the neck. And, you know, necks will go all kinds of different angles, right? Same thing with the men. And let's put it all together. And there are your three-quarter and profile faces. Now, real quick, I'm going to show you how to do a one-quarter face. And you're like, what the hell is a one-quarter face? A one-quarter face is when you see most of the back of your head, but you see like a little bit of cheekbone. It's the exact back view of this three-quarter head. So we have the head shape cheekbone, eyebrow ridge, and chin. But then all you see is a little bit of eyelash. Sometimes you see a little bit of nose, not often. You're gonna put your ear in here, your jaw, the back of your jaw is back here, and there's your neck, but this is the back of the head. Your hairline goes like so. There's your bun back here, cause that's the center back line of your head. that hair going up into the bun like that and there is a quarter face from the back I don't really understand when people draw back view figures and you could still see so much of the face like when 
like how far back can you that that just seems like it does not feel sexy to me to like have a back view and then have your whole face showing as well how oh, okay i'm too old for that right i think it looks more sexy and natural when you're looking at someone from the back you only see a little bit of their face because they're standing kind of naturally like this you know or maybe just the back of the head same with guys here's that edge of the eyebrow ridge and the jaw and whatnot here is his ear there's the shape of his hair back of his head neck his hair is going up behind his ear And there are your quarter heads. Real easy, right? I like tell students, it's like, uh, you're trying to draw a face on a back view figure and you're like contorting the body into a weird pose and you have to go to all the trouble of drawing the face. Just like forget it, just draw a quarter head. And when I tell them that, you can like feel and see almost visually the relief pouring off their bodies. I occasionally enjoy being the bearer of good news. <laughs> On that note, you know, I keep meaning to do a video on back view and side view croaky figures, but I keep getting these subscriber requests and I, the subscriber request queue is really long. This video, I had it planned, but I put it in, uh, but I shot it because I got a, a subscriber request reminder like, hey, remember when you're going to do this? I'm still waiting. Ha ha. Okay, 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 and uh, you know, I mean, politeness works for me, okay? When people are polite, I totally wanna help them. So if you guys are really want the side and back view figure videos, I will put that in the queue. If it's crickets, then I'll know that I can move on to other things, okay, just let me know. But that's it for three quarter profile and quarter faces. The next in the face series is going to be about adding color. And so we're going to be talking about skin tones and rendering and how to do makeup that doesn't look like a drag queen. Unless you want it to look like a drag queen, I could show you all about that too because I love drag queens. You know the drill. If you have a question, check the info box. If the answer is not there, drop me a comment. You know, I like polite subscriber requests and tears of joy and gratitude. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. Go practice, have fun, draw some beautiful faces going all different ways. Maybe you can even do an illustration of that girl in the exorcist who keeps spinning her head around now that you know all the angles of the face. All right, I'll see you next time. Hello, my lovelies. Welcome to Faces video number four. We're going to be talking about skin tones. In this video, I'm going to show you how to mix skin tone colors using a variety of media. Gouache, markers, watercolor pencils, and just a billion things, right? Whatever I have going on in here. Here's what I'm not going to go over in this video. I'm not going to talk about drawing faces, drawing different angles of faces. I'm not going to talk about the specifics of rendering faces or makeup. I'm not going to talk about, you know, why I place my shadows, where I place them, because I've already gone over all those topics in previous face videos. Okay. There's no point in a series if I just keep repeating myself, right? Okay. So today I'm going to teach you, hey, mix these colors to get a good skin tone. Here are some good marker options for skin tones. Okay. That's the focus of this video. This is my second most requested video to date. And it all started when I posted this flesh tones chart on my Instagram. Now, I created this teaching tool for my in-person students. This is 100% gouache, which is my preferred watercolor medium of choice. 
and I'm going to show you how to mix these color tones. There are a lot of beautiful watercolor artists out there who are doing beautiful things with gouache and watercolor and whatnot, where you have these like incredibly dark brown skin tones with like blue shadows and like silver highlights and these colors all working together just make everything about this portrait gorgeous, you know, playing with complementary colors to create deep shadows and all these beautiful things. And I love all those beautiful things and I admire the hell out of people who can do those things. However, I'm not an illustrator. I'm a designer. And my illustrations have always been about focusing on the clothes, focusing my attention and my time on getting the details right on my garments, making sure that my knits look chunky and fuzzy and that my jackets look perfectly tailored and my tweeds looking appropriately tweedy. And skin color is it should look like skin. It should make a body look 3D and that's kind of it. I don't spend a, a whole lot of time, a whole lot of time, a whole lot of time laboring over it. And so what I end up doing is I mix actually the shadow color. I take some, move it into another bubble in my palette. I add a little bit more water to it to get a lighter shade, AKA a more diluted version of the color. And that's my skin color. I paint the skin color. I wait for the whole shebang to dry. And then I take the darker color and I put in the shadows. Sometimes I'll do a third color if I want to get more detailed and the rendering style that I've chosen for the project is a lot more elaborate. I'll do that, but I will do typically at least one shadow color to create the 3D effect. There are a lot of things you can do, a lot of different colors you could mix uh, and combine to get skin tones. I'm going to show you what works for me as kind of a starting point for you to go and explore. So Windsor & Newton is my tried and true brand that I love. Uh, some of you know that I went to Japan recently and I picked up a few different brands of gouache to test out, but I don't have any sort of definitive results on that. So we're going to stick to these for now. Now you'll see that the Windsor & Newton tubes are silver now. The white labels are kind of just it's the same stuff, just older, and gouache lasts a really long time, and so I have these older tubes, which are perfectly fine. This is the Burnt Sienna, and I use Burnt Sienna as a base for my lightest to my kind of dark medium color bases. This is Burnt Umber, and I use the Burnt Umber as a base for these darker skin tones. I use a yellow ochre never by itself because it's too green, makes someone look a little bit sickly. Okay? But I use that to temper some of the orangeness of the burnt sienna. Sometimes I use an ultramarine or another similarly dark reddish blue, not a yellowish blue, nothing too turquoisey. And cadmium red. I like this to create my rosier skin tones. You know, girls who wear makeup, they're familiar with buying foundation where you have like, you know, warm undertones, cool undertones, neutral undertones, you know, and you go and check for your undertones so you can figure out which foundation works best for you, you know, just like that. I use Naples Yellow when I want to create more golden, you know, kind of Asian looking skin tones. And then... Of course, I use, I add a little bit of black to create these darkest skin tones. And even if I am doing a super dark skin tone like this corner in here, I never use straight up black for shadowing because it looks really harsh. I will always put in a little bit of the burnt umber as well. So these are the main colors that I use in gouache to create skin tones. And I use the exact same things in watercolor. So I'm not going to double up on those demos. Okay. I prefer gouache when I'm doing darker skin tones because my personal preference is that darker colors look better when they're more opaque paint. I think that the 
more opaque paint makes the color look richer and darker, which is kind of the intent of darker colors. And that applies for skin and fabrics and anything really. I never use white for skin tone. With watercolor, the best way to lighten a watercolor is to add water, not white. White tends to add a texture, a chalkiness. And so when you add white to skin tones, you end up with that kind of like old school 50s, like pancake makeup looking sort of thing. Kind of that chalky, bad foundation sort of look, which you don't want. You want skin to look like skin. So as usual, I have my palette, I have my water jar, I have my sable round watercolor brushes. I have some clean paper towels. And I'm gonna mix a few of these. I'm not gonna mix every single one in this chart here because you, I mean, this took a long time to make. I'm gonna get you guys started a little bit. Again, don't use your teeth to open these tubes. So I'm gonna start with this burnt sienna. And I just wanna show you guys this burnt sienna and how orange it is. To temper some of this orange, I like to use a little bit of this yellow ochre. You see how it's maybe a little bit less tangy, but still a little bit fake and bake. If I want something golden like this, a little bit of this Naples yellow. Creamier golden tone. If I wanted it cooler, I would add a tiny bit. Do you see how tiny bit? of the ultramarine that I'm using. You know, complementary colors, orange and blue, will uh, tone down the intensity of either color when you mix them together. Okay, you can always add more, so always start real light. All right, I like that. So I'm gonna take a well of water. Number one rule of painting, if you want smooth, always paint one section at a time so that everything is wet at the same time and dry at the same time. Let's pretend there's a collar there and that's where we cut off. And then you're going to wait for it to dry completely before you take a slightly skinnier brush if you want. And then you would add your shadows. I'm not doing it right now because this is still wet, but. If you shadow when things are still wet, you get a softer edge, which is awesome if you know how to paint, but it is harder to control. You just keep that in mind. If you want it even more toned down than this, all you would have to do is add a touch more blue and you would get this tone family. If you want this rosy tone, we take our original burnt sienna and yellow ochre and add a bit of the cadmium red. You can use whatever red you have hanging out. You don't have to go out and... Did I just absorb all of my paint into my paintbrush? Yes, I did. Burnt sienna, little yellow ochre, little cadmium red. Okay, let's add a little bit of that blue. And there we have our pinker, rosier skin, skin tones this family of skin tones here, okay? Now, for this middle row, you're going to be using a lot more paint because you're getting much more opaque. 
You're going to take your burnt umber, you're going to take your burnt sienna, and you're going to add a lot of this burnt umber to it. That's nice. That's this family in here. Okay. You're not going to water it down too much. When you have darker colors like this, this is what happens when you water it down. It just doesn't have the same impact and it starts looking grainy. And then for super dark skin tone, sometimes I'll just use burnt umber straight out of the tube because look at how beautiful that color is. You don't need to fix that. That's gorgeous. If you want it any darker, I'd add a little bit of black, you know, for a little bit of shadow. All right, and get even chocolatier, but the burnt umber on its own is a really beautiful brown, okay? So to recap, golden skin tones, we have a burnt sienna, yellow ochre, a little bit of the blue, and the Naples yellow. Rosy skin tones, we have the burnt sienna, the yellow ochre, the tiny bit of the ultramarine, and quite a bit of red to get that pinky undertone, cool undertone. To get these mahogany skin tones, burnt sienna and burnt umber. And then the chocolatiest skin tones, burnt umber straight out of the tube or with a little bit of black. All right? When you're mixing your watercolor colors, you want to mix in your most opaque darkest color your shadow color and then distribute your paint into little bubbles and then add a little bit of water to get your three values of the same color i mean those of you who watch my channel know that this is what i do with all painting whether it's a blouse or skin okay mix the shadow color and then dilute a little bit for the base color for those of you who like to work with ink, I have the Higgins ink, and this is the only brand of ink that I've ever used before. And if you guys have another brand of ink that you absolutely adore and you really need me to try it because it is the second coming of Jesus and you really need to spread the good word, then let me know. I'm gonna take a little bit of this brown. There's no special color name, it's just brown. And I like a little bit of orange, black. Just a reminder that I prefer dye-based inks or waterproof drawing inks over pigment-based inks. Here's the brown by itself, which has a really nice rosy tone to it, which makes it really nice for darker skin tones. Here's a diluted version of that, and that one is not so great for skin tones. It loses some of the warmth, so I like to add a touch of orange. And you get these nice, cooler, rosy skin tones that are in this row, right? So that's a little bit of brown and a little bit of orange. And you can add a little bit more of the brown to make it a little less rosy. And then if you want to get a little bit darker, ooh, too much black, let's add some more brown. Those are very black. So you get these beautiful chocolatey skin tones. Although I'll be honest with you, I don't love ink for darker skin tones because like I said before, I prefer a more opaque, rich look for darker skin tones. And ink is just very translucent. It's very, nature is very translucent. And I don't love that look. It's not my favorite. Okay? Although if I'm doing an all ink illustration, I will use it, but I prefer the look of dark skin tones in gouache. You guys see the difference there? Okay, because the ink, it really shows the grain of the paper. I have three different 
kinds of watercolor pencils here. I have the uh, Faber-Cassell Albert Durer watercolor pencil in Venetian red and burnt ochre. I have the Derwent regular watercolor pencil, very English, watercolor with an O-U, in deep vermilion and copper beach. And then I have the Derwent Ink Tense watercolor pencils in Baked Earth, Willow, and Bark. And these are the ones that I've been using for skin colors. The Venetian Red is quite pink. And I use this as a blusher sometimes. And it's in that cool tone family. And the Burnt Ochre is a little bit on the yellow, ochre cool side, a little too yellow. And so, I will mix both to create the color I need. This deep vermilion makes for a nice rosy skin tone. This copper beach, depending on how dark you get, you can have a softer skin tone here. You can mix these two colors together to get a more Caucasian skin tone, or you can lay down a lot of color and get much darker skin tones here. Okay. And you know, it's like using color pencils and watercolor theory together where the more color pencil you add, the darker it is, which is like using a more opaque paint, you know, like more color equals darker color equals shadow color. And then here, this baked earth color just makes a really beautiful warm color that is really similar to the burnt sienna that were, we were using here. And so this makes an excellent base to mix with other colors. So here's the baked earth. Here's a bit of willow. There's a bit more willow. And you need to try these out with your hand and really sit and explore the different skin tones that you can create. Here's willow by itself, which makes a really nice skin tone family. Here is very opaque willow, which is this beautiful, rich brown. And then we have bark.
Oh, I love this color. Every time I use it, I squeal or groan or something. This bark is just this beautiful, chocolatey, purpley, dark skin color that I adore. If I ever do another all white collection and I'm illustrating it, I would use like a middle to light gray paper and use this color as my skin tone and then put them in all white dresses. <gasps> yes, that is what I would do. Beautiful. Okay. So those are some options for you guys for watercolor pencils. A couple of my students got together and bought me a bunch of these Winsor & Newton watercolor markers at the end of the semester and uh, as a farewell gift and uh, they're awesome. Out of the ones that I have, I also bought a few on my own and the Burnt Umber is really the only one that I would use as a skin color. That's a beautiful brown. And then you take a little bit of water and you can just soften and blend the edges. Woo. That's a little bit more on the goldy side and this one is more on the purple side, but that one is also really pretty. It's like a dark burnt toffee, so much pretty, it hurts. Now, this is a watercolor marker. Don't think that you can just do this with any markers, okay? Here's a Faber-Cassell, and this is just a regular marker, and the dark sepia. And wait, did I know that this, what? These are supposed to be waterproof. Um, It says it's waterproof, although I've never done that before. Um, <laughs> okay, I have some investigating to do. <laughs> I did not know that was going to happen, you guys. I, okay, That's, that was weird. Okay, well, here's a Copic. Well, tell me this one is going to start bleeding. Now, this actually acts like a marker and does nothing. Okay, so don't think that all markers are gonna do this. I mean, is it because I didn't let it dry? Let's see, let's let that dry for a second and see if it still bleeds. Okay, the more it dries, the less it bleeds, but it still bleeds. All right, note to self, if you are layering paint on top of marker and you don't want the marker to bleed, you can safely use Copics because the Copics won't bleed, but your favorite Cassells will blend out. Okay, it's dry and it's still bleeding out. You learn something new every day. All right, one last thing in the painting category. If you watched my Japan haul video, you know that I picked up some of these brush pens when I was over there. So if you follow me on Instagram, you know that I am falling in love with these. I'm having so much fun with these. This is the Kuratake Zig Clean Color Real Brush. This one is number 62 dark brown. And this is number 69 blush. And these colors are both super beautiful. They apply brushy, not solid like the Winsor & Newton watercolor marker. But when you add some water, they blend out really beautifully. And this dark brown, it also has a little bit of those purpley undertones so pretty now with watered down like this this is way too ashy to be a skin color but used more opaquely that's a nice dark brown this is the blush which makes for a really beautiful rosy toned you know english maiden who never saw the sun sort of peaches and cream skin tone. Those go well together like that. Ooh, so pretty. 
This is the Sai, S-A-I, Japanese traditional colors brush pen. And this one, again, applies very brushy, but blends out really beautifully. And this one is too golden to use on its own, so I would probably mix it with another color for skin color, but I just wanted to show you how cool that was. <laughs> I'm still tripping out on that marker thing. That's crazy. I think I need to pick up more of those markers. I have a whole playlist of videos that deep dive into my shopping patterns for different media. I have a video on, you know, what I look for when I shop for paints, intro to paints, intro to color pencils, intro to markers. So when I shop for markers, okay, and if you're really interested, I want you to go watch those, but the important keynote for this is whenever I buy markers, I buy markers in pairs. I buy the base color, whether it's skin, hair, clothing, whatever. And then I buy a color for the shadow color. And whenever I test the color, I test them layered on top of each other because that's how I'm going to use them in my rendering. This is a Prismacolor Brick Beige, and this is a color that I use often for Caucasian skin tones. And if I'm at the store testing this out, I will paint a swatch, and then I will pick a few that I think would be good shadow colors. This is Cinnamon Toast, and I would layer the color directly on top because Cinnamon Toast looks different by itself than it does layered on top. Do you see on top of the brick beige, it looks pinkier and rosier than it does by itself? So since you're going to be using it in this way, you need to test it out in this way. And here I see that the change is very subtle, and so this would be great if I wanted very subtle shadows. This is my light walnut. Again, see the difference by itself and layered on top. And this is a great color because this is in the same family, but it's a more marked difference. And so I would use that if I were wanted a slightly pinker skin tone and more prominent shadows. I could even double those up to create those uh, double shadow looks. And this is light tan, and that is really dark. Actually, I would use light walnut as a base for a darker skin tone a darker rosy skin tone, and then use the light tan as a great shadow color. If I want someone looking a super duper pale, I use Prismacolor Almond Milk. And you're like, you didn't do anything. That looks like a colorless blender. I know, I know, it's really, really pale. And then I would take my Brick Beige and use that for my shadows. This is a Copic number E34 Oriental, which is a very golden skin tone. See how rosy and pink those are and how golden that is. So if you like that look, this is E33 Sand layered on top. And that's a great shadow color for that. If that's your skin tone, this is E35 Chamois. And that's a nice shadow color for that. Although I would say that chamois by itself looks a little bit too much like yellow ochre straight and it's bordering on green. And I think this is too green for skin tone. So this is the E35 chamois. But layered on top of the E33 sands, it makes a nice shadow color, but by itself it's a touch too green. And that's why you have to buy them in pairs like that. And here is uh, E23 Hazelnut. And that's a nice medium tone. And this is E25 Caribe Cocoa, which is a nice shadow color for that. And 
We're getting a little bit darker and rosier in here. This is the Prismacolor Light Tan on top of the Copic Caribe Cocoa. And that's a nice subtle shadowing. This is Prismacolor Dark Brown. And it's not my favorite dark skin tone. It's like a little, it's a little dull. I much prefer the Prismacolor Cocoa Bean. Because this color is just so rich and gorgeous. And it looks opaque like these skin tones here. Then I would take my favorite Cassell Dark Sepia to shadow that. That's Cocoa Bean on top of the dark brown as the shadow. So what I like to do and try to do is to buy kind of a family of colors where each can be paired so each color can be a base color and a shadow. And then the next one can be a darker base and a shadow. And then the next one can be a darker base and a shadow like that. Okay. Saves up on markers and then you get this whole family of skin colors at your disposal. Here's the cocoa bean again. And I shadowed it with black. And you see how artificial and strange that looks? even though this dark brown is such a dark color that you would think that the black would be okay. I think that that looks awful. Okay, so don't shadow with black, y'all. Even with the Faber-Cassell, which is my darkest, okay, don't shadow skin with black, no matter how dark Alec Weck black you get, don't shadow with black. Obviously, there are a million other marker colors out there, but I just named a few in my collection to help you guys get started in your skin tone marker hunt. If you get stuck trying to figure out your paint colors, try swatching a marker and try mixing a paint to match your marker color. Some people have an easier job of mixing paints when they have something to match it back to, okay? So if you want something that looks like this, okay, that looks kind of in that family. And so you know that I mixed brown and orange in the inks to create this color family. These colors are in here where I use the burnt sienna yellow ochre and the Naples yellow and a touch of that ultramarine to get this family of colors. Here's another skin color that I like, Prismacolor Walnut. There's that beautiful mahogany, medium, rosy skin color in between your lightest, darkest, kind of in this family. Love that. Oof, that's pretty. With color pencils, you have one of two methods, okay? You can take one single color pencil and you can color everything lightly and then color your shadows in more darkly. This is Prismacolor in Burnt Ochre. And then you can just color more intensely to create the shadows, which is basically, you know, more saturated paint. Or you can take a color like this, and maybe you don't want this soft, dry, grainy look and you want to really press in the color so that it looks more waxy and smooth. All right, I'm doing this on Bristol board right now, which is my favorite paper for color pencil work. So really press that color pencil into your paper. And then, like you do with markers, is to just pick another color pencil in a darker color. This is Sienna Brown to put in your shadows. So I'm going to put in my cheekbone shadows, eye socket, nose ridge, nostril, under the lip. All right? So there's your burnt ochre. There's your Sienna Brown alone. There's your Sienna Brown on top of your Burnt Ochre. Again, if you're going to use two colors together, layer them on top of each other like the way you would use them. 
This is beige, which is what I like to use for goldeny, pale, possibly Asian skin tones. This is Prismacolor in light peach, which is pinkier, and I think too pink for a skin tone. So what I'll end up doing is I'll mix it with the beige to create light but pinkier skin tones. Also an excellent shadow color for the beige. This is Prismacolor in peach. And I only get really this rosy if I'm doing children's wear because kids look cute with little peaches and cream rosy skin tones. Okay. And then here is dark brown in Prismacolor, which is a great chocolatey color for darker skin tones. Unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of color pencil skin tones because it's very rare that I do a full head to toe fashion illustration and color pencil, but these should get you started. And that's it guys. You know, I can't give you anything much more exact than that because you guys are all over the world and you are all using different painting styles, different paints, different brands of paints, you know, different brushes, okay, and different marker brands. And, you know, some of you are telling me about brands I never heard of before, and that's awesome. But this is to help you get started picking out good colors, some methods that I use when I'm trying to figure out skin colors, different media. If you have marker marker color favorites in the brands that you use that you want to share with us please leave them in the comments you know i love it like some of you guys have started uh helping each other out like some people will throw out questions and some people will answer like hey this was my experience and i love that like i would love to build a community on this channel where you guys are also helping each other by giving each other feedback and offering suggestions just as if we were in a classroom environment and students would be discussing what works for them and what doesn't, right? That's awesome. I love it when you guys do that. So yeah, let me know in the comments if you have something that works beautifully for you that you would recommend to someone else, especially in the color pencil category that is a little bit on the small side for me. As usual, if you have any questions, check the info box. If your answer is not there, leave me a comment below. Oh, and you know, uh, share, subscribe, like, you know, all those things that uh, vloggers are supposed to prompt you with, right? All that good stuff. Hashtag always be practicing, and I will see you next time. Hey guys, so this is my third installment of the face series. The first video was all about... Um, proportions for male and female front view faces. The second video was translating those proportions to three quarter profile and one quarter heads. And then this one is all gonna be about how to illustrate them using various media. And I'm going to demo uh, marker, color pencil, and paint today. Side note, I already have uh, approximately 17 million videos on hair. Okay, that might be a slight exaggeration in numbers. Yes, I have a whole hair series. So I'm not going to talk about hair in this video at all. If you're interested in learning all about hair, I will drop the playlist link in the info box below. And there's even a video that goes over facial hair, stubble, mustaches, all that good stuff. So go check that out if you have any questions on that. So first, let's talk about making your faces look 3D using shading. Now, if you're familiar with my approach to illustration, I have a three kinds of shadow approach to lighting and shading of my figures. I have a whole video on that. So if you wanna watch that, I'll drop the link in the info box, but real quick, number one, you pick a diagonal light source and then you drop in your shadows according to that light source. Whenever you shadow, you shadow with the same medium you used for your base color, unless you want to change the texture. 
So if your skin is marker, shadow with marker. If your skin is ink, shadow with ink. If you shadow with color pencil on top of marker, that signifies a texture change. And usually that just ends up looking like body hair. I was students shadow legs with a color pencil instead of a darker marker it just ends up looking like leg hair three kinds of shadow diagonal light source number one your first kind of shadow will be shadows that happen because the light is above the face so for example since your eyelids go into your eye sockets your eyelids okay this little bit in here under the mouth goes in second kind of shadow shadows that happen on the side away from the light so again if my light source is over here then this side of my face is going to be dark number three cast shadows so anything blocking the light will cast a shadow onto other parts like the jaw will cast a shadow onto the neck so if my light source is over here then the side of the nose I generally do not draw a nose. Like I drew it for my underdrawing, but when I'm actually getting to the rendering part, I won't really draw a significant nose, but just shadow against it to form the shape. And then the temple, all oh, the dark side. I like to carve out a bit of cheekbone. This whole ear is dark because it's blocked by the whole head. I like to shadow the inside of the ear here because it is darker than the rest. I like to shadow inside the nostrils, of course. This dark side of the neck, under the jaw, under the Adam's apple for men. And you see how you're building the face. Same thing for women. I tend to keep the uh, shadows a little bit curvier because I want everything to be curvier on a woman's face I will often make the upper lip darker because it's slanting down under the light cheekbone jaw Now this shadow for the nose, it is what forms the nose. So make sure that you have a nice shape. I prefer faces to face the light. Sometimes it can't be helped because, you know, you'll have a lineup of multiple figures and some faces are going this way and some faces are going that way. And you should have a single light source for all the figures in one lineup. Otherwise it looks kind of weird and confusing. And so sometimes you are gonna have faces facing away from the light, but ideally I would have faces facing the light. Face, face, facing the fight, facing the light, facing the light, faces facing the light. How many times can I say face? Face! So if my light source is over here, I'm still gonna have the eyelids, the dark side of the nose here, around the nostril, inside the nostril, temple, cheekbone, this whole ear under the jaw and the back of the neck. But if you were to have the light behind the head, all this is in shadow turning away, especially, you know, the nose blocking all this face. It's still the inside of the ear. It's pretty dark. Cast shadow under the jaw. And then the dark side of the neck and always the nostrils. And if your light source is facing the light, again here, along the nose a little bit. Nostril, lip, under the mouth. under the jaw and if your profile was facing away from the light your whole face is in shadow 
because it's facing away from the light. And then the only thing that would be not in shadow is the tip of the ears and the back of the neck. I'm gonna start by rendering with paint. Whenever you're going to be doing a rendering where you're going to eventually put pencil, color pencil, details on top of paint, you want to make sure that your paint is 319% dry before you start adding other media. And so I'm going to paint the faces now and then I'm going to let it dry while I'm doing other parts of the demo and then we're going to go back in and do the details. This is a flesh tones color chart that I did a while back using gouache and I'm going to teach you guys how to create these skin tones in faces video number four. But just as just to get you guys started, I like to use bird sienna in either the watercolor or the gouache to create anywhere from these super light skin tones all the way down to the medium skin tones. If I want to make my skin tones a little bit more golden, I will add a Naples yellow or I will add yellow ochre. If I want a rosier skin tone, I will add a tiny bit of a really warm red like cadmium red or flame red. These much darker skin tones down here are built on a burnt umber base, I recommend that you use gouache because gouache is going to be the thing that gives you these nice, opaque, beautiful, smooth skin tones. Whenever I'm working with skin tones in paint, I will mix first the shadow color, which is a shade or two darker than my intended skin tone. Because the way you lighten up gouache or any other kind of watercolor is to add water, I mix up the darker color and then I distribute some to another well in my palette and then I add some water. This is a combination of mostly the burnt sienna gouache, a touch of the burnt umber and a touch of the red. So I'm going to take some of this, I'm going to put it in another well, I'm going to add water. create a lighter color. Remember my number one rule of painting, paint one section at a time so that it can be wet at the same time and dry at the same time. Always leave the whites of your eyes because otherwise they're going to look jaundiced and I don't care if that space is actually super teeny tiny. You go ahead and push some of that color into your hairline so that you don't get a white halo. And I'm going to let that dry before I add my shadows. Okay, anytime you have excess paint, just squeeze out your brush and then just pick up. Now I've decided that that is going to be my light source for both figures. So I'm going to take my shadow color. Now, in real life, most people's nostrils look black, but if you paint black dots in the center of your face, your eye will go right to those dots. And so I like to tone it down by using my shadow color instead. because those bangs are going to cast a shadow onto her forehead. Now we're going to set this aside to dry. As usual, if I'm not working with a lot of asymmetry, I like to render on the wrong side and I like to draw on the right side. Ugh. I like to draw on the wrong side and render on the right side. Ah! Whenever you're testing markers and you're trying to figure out the right shadow color, don't put the shadow color next to your base color. You wanna put your shadow color 
on top of your base color because that's how you're going to use it. This is Brick Beige and this is Cinnamon Toast. Again, leave the whites of the eyes. And then press a little bit of that skin color into the hairline so that you can have a natural overlap. So that when you take a color like walnut and put in the hair, you're not gonna have white spaces. You're going to have skin showing because that's what happens with our hair, you know? I'm going to take my cinnamon toast and add my shadows. I'm going to have my light source over here. So eyebrows are hair. And so I like to use color pencil to create that hairy eyebrow texture. When you color in your eyes, you know, people think, oh, beautiful, bright blue eyes. I'm going to pick a really bright blue. But maybe it's because we're so used to CG effects, but blue eyes aren't really that bright. And you don't want like ting, ting little pins of bright blue eyes. It just, it looks really unnatural. So I will use a much softer green or a much softer blue, you know, blue gray, something like that. Now, most of the time, you're not going to see the pupil and everything in there, but when, you have, when you're doing faces this big, you are, so I am going to put in my pupil, otherwise it looks really strange. And sometimes I like to take a white gel pen and put in a sparkle dot. You're going to match up the texture of your eye makeup to your medium. So if you wanted a girl to look like she was wearing liquid liner, I would use a fine liner like a print micron. If you're going to use like a smudgy, smoky look, then I would go color pencil and you can give it that smoke. With blush, you have a couple of different options. You can use a really soft marker or you can use color pencil to do some shadowing, really subtle. And then I'm gonna take my 0 0.7 2B pencil to do my finishing. I got a request to do a drag face when I was doing this rendering video. So I'm gonna do a drag face. So for a slightly darker skin tone, I'm gonna to use the cinnamon toast for the base and the light walnut for the shadow. Now I drew these next to each other so you can see kind of where I'm starting. This was my original female front face. And then this one, I exaggerated the feature some as a base for my drag face. I made the bones of her face more prominent. I made her ears bigger. I made her eyebrows arch more, her eyes bigger and her mouth bigger. Oh man, I did not mean to do that. Here's my white light walnut. I'm going to pretend that my light source is over here. Side of the nose, nostrils, cheekbone, and under the chin, the Adam's apple. This whole ear is in shadow, and then the inside of this ear. Leave that eyebrow pad light, but shadow the rest of her eyelid. And then because I want it to be super high drama, I'm going to take a darker color. I'm going to just add some more shadows, super high drama. 
and I'm going to do my eyebrows with a color pencil and I'm just going to get super high archy drama with it and then the makeup is going to be very dramatic. Man, I love drag queens. I'm so behind on RuPaul's Drag Race because I'm behind on TV, period. It's crazy how behind on TV I am. No queen would be caught without her lashes. Make sure you give her her lashes. And I'm going to give her red lipstick like a little pointy Cupid's bow for drag queens. And I'm going to add some contour blusher here. Just not the same as shadow. What's a queen without her contour? And then I'm going to take my, my fat soft pencil and do my finishing. I'm going to accentuate that bone structure. And then I'm going to take my white gel pen and I'm going to add a little gloss to the bottom lip. And I'm going to add a little eye sparkle in here. And there's your drag queen. With color pencil, the thing that is different from the others really is how to do the skin color because the rest of it is the same, you know, using color pencil to, you know, do eye makeup and eyebrows and, you know, all that kind of thing. My thing is don't make it look like you have a brush stroke. It should look just even and smooth. The nice thing about color pencil is you can create gradients. So with like sh some paint methods and the marker, you get some harsher lines, but with color pencil, you can create fades and ombres and gradients and you can have really dark shadows that soften. I'm using this burnt ochre Prismacolor right now. Nice and soft, slow build. Okay, that's the thing about color pencils. It's a slow medium, which is nice when you're first starting out and don't have a whole lot of control yet. Pencil strokes for your eyebrows, your eye makeup. Sometimes graphite will fight with your color pencil, and so I will do these finishing touches with a black color pencil instead. Some people don't like the grainy look and would prefer a more smooth, waxier look for color pencil. So you can try burnishing. Just when you take a lighter color pencil and you color in the spaces so that you get a solid fill and kind of blending those two colors together.
You can also try the rubbing alcohol trick that I taught you guys in my how to do hair with color pencil thing video. So I'm using this light peach color. When you do burnishing, I do recommend that you stick to the same brand so that the base wax or oil or whatever are the same and they tend to blend together better. So yeah, some people prefer this more filled in look. I do not, but I do teach methods that are not my favorite so that my students can make their own decisions. How's that for crazy? They can have their own preferences for things. I know, that's just bananas. And so you can have a smoother look. Again, I would take my color pencil and Options. Options are good, you know? Do your own thing. So yeah, there's nothing really different about the face with the paint. You put in your base color, you put in your shadows, and then you wait for everything to dry so that you can freely put in all your dry media details like hair. Her, I'm gonna give her some really soft painted blusher. I want to give her a little bit of a cutesy look. Blend those edges with some water. You can also just do this with color pencil as well. It'll read like blusher. I'm taking a clean, damp brush to the edges here so I can get rid of some of these harsh lines. And then I'm using a very almost dry gouache to do hair and eyebrows. Skinny little synthetic brush. Have I done a hair tutorial with paint? Can't remember. But, oh no, I don't think I have. So, if you want one, just drop me a comment. I'll add that to the ever growing massive list of tutorials. My God, you guys, my subscriber request list is a little bit crazy. A little bit crazy. Crazy isn't over 20 videos long, crazy. All right, and then when this is all dry, 319% dry, I'm gonna go back in and put in some finishing details with my pencil. But nothing is new or different from the techniques I just showed you with the marker and the color pencil. So that's how I color faces, guys. When I do croquis size faces, faces tend to be about an inch tall. And so I really don't get super elaborate. Sometimes I don't even add you know, the little sparkle dot or pupils or anything in the eyes because I just don't have enough space, right? And, you know, because I'm a designer, I just want a good enough face to illustrate my customer. I'm not over-involved in creating a face that is the focal point of my illustration. 
Now, people tend to look at faces first. That's just human instinct. And so our faces should be rendered very prettily, handsomely, insert adverb here. But, you know, again, my energy and time goes more into the design and the rendering of the design itself. You guys know the drill. You have a question, check my info box. If the answer is not there, drop me a comment. So go practice, practice your adorable little faces and your sexy faces and your amazing exaggerated drag faces, you know, do all of them. All right. And I will see you next time. Hey, hey party people and Merry Christmas to those of you who celebrate it. In this video, I'm going to go over painting little heads. I have a faces playlist where I get into the nitty gritty of proportions and how to draw lips and angles like three quarter view versus profile view. And then I also have a video on how to mix skin tones and that's all in the faces playlist. But in those videos, I scaled the drawings up a little bit just so the camera would pick them up better so you guys could see better. Same thing with my hair tutorials. I have, um, I think, half a dozen hair tutorials. And most of those tutorials are done with marker, but the basics of hair rendering are the same for paint. You know, where you place your highlights, where you place your shadows, you know, how to develop texture. All those things are about the same. So if you want deep dives into hair, go check out my hair playlist. But again, for the sake of visibility and, you know, camera work and all that stuff, the heads are a little bit on the big side. But I say this often, my standard fashion figure is about 13 inches. You know, fashion designers, we don't really paint or draw that big. Like we can do like large gesture figure drawing, but for design communication, we don't often draw very big. So you kind of have to get in the habit of being able to render these little itty bitty heads. You know, you can tell how small they are because I have really little hands. Um, <laughs> my friends kind of tease me all the time that my hands are kind of small. And look at how small the heads are in comparison to my hand. So let's talk in this video more about how to work on such a teeny tiny scale. The first thing is gonna be the tools that you use. Okay. I am currently painting with a number four round. And throughout this video, I'm using number four, number three, and I think a zero size round brushes. I'm not using any other kind of brush. And if you need a primer on brushes, I have a whole video I did recently called Intro to Brushes where I go over shapes and sizes and what all that means. But use smaller brushes, of course, but not only use smaller brushes, but use brushes that have a good point. Okay? As I went over in my Intro to Brushes video, squirrel hair brushes do not hold a nice point. I recently got a squirrel, and I'm, I'm irritated at how moppish it is. It doesn't hold a point. So the brushes that I'm using today, they're all rounds that hold a good point. So not only are they small, but they hold a small point. And, you know, you could be thinking, well, if they're all about holding a good point, then I can use any size. Yeah, yes or no, <laughs> because you don't want too big of a brush, because if your brush holds a lot of paint, one little slip up and like all that paint that's being held in the brush head could just kind of gush out. So you also want to control how much paint is in your brush. So smaller brushes, zeros, one, two, three, four size range, round size, with a really nice point. Synthetics make a nice point. Sable, uh, one of my favorites is a Sable Synthetic Blend from Winsor & Newton. That one has a nice point. There, there are a lot of options out there. I'm gonna be doing a brush testing follow-up video in the next year. I always use 
a 0.3 size mechanical pencil and a super skinny eraser. The super skinny eraser is not really that high quality of an eraser. Okay, it's, it doesn't erase really great, but it gets into the teeny tiny little spaces. If you watch my videos, then you know that my two favorite erasers are the Pentel Click and the Tombow Mono. And I use the Pentel Click Sticky Eraser for most of my erasing. And then if I really need to get into the tight spaces, I will use the itty bitty little Tombow uh, Mono. When you're drawing teeny tiny little faces, or in general, teeny tiny details, it's actually much easier to use hot press watercolor paper than it is to use cold press or rough paper. Because the texture of the cold press can kind of fight with your drawing. And if you need things to be really precise, like, you know, eyebrows and little teeny tiny lips and such, it can be easier to just have a paper where you don't have to fight with the texture. I am actually using cold press paper now. I'm using Arches 300 GSM, 140 pound cold press watercolor paper. It is one of my favorite watercolor papers. And I'm doing this so I can show you that you can, you work carefully and you practice, uh, work a little bit more slowly, you can get a nice, precise detail with the texture cold press paper. But if you're just starting out, the hot press will probably be easier for you. I did not draw freehand draw these on this nice paper. I never do that for super precise work. I always draw everything out on regular paper, make all my mistakes, do all my erasing and redrawing, and then use a light box to trace off my finished pencil drawings onto the watercolor paper. Because I don't like I don't want to do a lot of erasing on my final painting paper because it really messes up the texture. And I don't like a lot of the time, especially with textured cold press paper, not all the graphite comes off because you gotta like really get in the teeny tiny spaces. So if you er erase aggressively enough to get rid of the graphite, then you've killed the texture, you've ruined the surface of the paper. So I like to do all my rough drafts and then trace my final drawing onto the paper before I paint. You'll see that I draw like really basic shapes. Okay, with the head of hair, I draw just the basic shape of the style. I draw one single line for the shape of the eyebrow. I don't start off by drawing all these individual eyelashes and all this stuff. I keep the initial drawing as simple as possible. Only the lines needed to know where to put the paint. Okay, first of all, like, you're probably going to paint over all those details, so you're going to have to redraw them anyway, and that's extra work. Secondly, I don't want a lot of graphite to be smeared around while I'm painting, okay? I'm really conscious of watching out for graphite smearing a lot. That's why you'll see that extra piece of paper I slide under my hand to protect whatever drawing is there. Because I like to rest my hand on the table, as most of us do, Whenever I'm painting, first of all, I make sure that the thing that I might cover with my hand is dry, and then I'll lay a little scrap piece of paper over it, and then I'll use that so I'm not smearing paint, I'm not smearing graphite, I'm keeping all of my drawing clean. Another thing I like to do that has nothing to do with tiny heads, but everything to do with painting, is use that scrap for testing colors. I like never lay down my brush without testing up the color first. You know, what's that saying? Measure twice, cut once. That's me. I like do just like, a, it's become automatic for me to just take a scrap, test, make sure it's the color I want, or make sure that my paintbrush is clean if I'm just trying to lay down some water. Saves so much heartache. It's like when I'm working in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop, it's like every five moves, it's like a automatic command S. I'm constantly saving as I'm going. 
Because you can always Command Z a bunch of times and go backwards and change things. But, you know, Command S, man. Just make it like a like an automatic thing that you do, okay? Test what's on your brush before you put it down on your final paper. Keep saving your document as you're working. Just good habits to just have ingrained in your hands. So while I'm painting eyes, okay, tips on painting eyes for small faces. First of all, if you want to paint blue eyes or green eyes, you know, I see this all the time where people use like super bright blue, super bright green, and it just looks so jarring because, you know, people have bright blue eyes and bright green eyes and I've seen them, but they're not as bright as you think they are. Okay, so calm down. Go look at some pictures of non-photoshopped nice blue eyes and try to match that color. And they're actually going to be a lot duller than you originally thought. I will typically do a blue-gray for bright blue eyes. And they read blue. When you are painting the eyes, don't make the colored part like a perfect circle. Because when you look at someone's eyes that are open naturally, you don't see the full circle of the color. You only see that when they're just like wide-eyed and startled or shocked or scared. You're not going to see the whole round. So make sure that you're, it looks more like a U, like a semicircle than a perfect circle. So what I like to do is take a little brush and I like to drop down like a tiny droplet of paint and then just sort of smash the top part. Make sure it's not like a perfect round bead because that can look really weird. Now with eyes, the only, <laughs> those of you who've watched my channel a lot know that I kind of mostly totally hate gel pens. And <laughs> this is the only time I really like using a gel pen is when I put that little shine spot in the eye. I just take my gel pen, make sure the ink is flowing nicely, and just put one dot off center in the colored part of the eye. Just one dot in each eye. Now, if they have a dark brown black eye, then you're not going to see the pupil which is the little black part in the very center of your eye. But if you have a light blue, light green eye, you're going to see that. So I just go in there with a pencil and just draw in that little dot. See, but that little white gel pen dot kind of gives the eye life, don't you think? Speaking of eyes, don't forget that your eyes need to be pointing at the same thing. So really be careful of that. <laughs> okay? I mean... I've had students where, for some reason, every time they try to get their model to look straight, they end up looking cross-eyed. So I'm like, look, if they're looking off to the side, it's fine. Looking off to the side is not distracting. Making a model cross-eyed is distracting, okay? You don't want to distract from the clothes. If she looks off to the side, it's fine. It's not distracting. She's just looking over there, which is nothing abnormal about that, right? You may be wondering why I keep bouncing around from head to head to head, and that's because I need to wait for layers of paint to dry in between steps. And this is especially important the smaller, more detailed the item your painting is. Okay, because, you know, you don't have a lot of space to get all painterly and wet on wet and get all blendy and stuff. And so I will paint one layer of skin and then I'll wait for it to dry by painting something else and then paint a layer of shadow, paint something else, come back and paint another layer of shadow and keep progressing in that way. And a lot of the time with spaces so small that even if you paint something next to it, it you can mess up your painting. I've already done that a couple of times. You may have picked up on that. In those cases, what you need to do is take a clean, mostly dry brush, dab the mistaken paint, you know, while it's still wet, just dab at it, and the paint will suck it up, 
clean out your brush, add a little bit of water, kind of mix it into the paper, and then again, like scoop it up with a dry brush, and you should be able to pick up the mistake. Let that space of paper dry, come back and paint again. So that's why I keep bouncing around. It's like, let this portion dry, let this portion dry. And if I was drawing a single figure, if you watch my basic wash illustration tutorial, you'll have noticed that I'll do the face and then I'll draw the feet and then I'll work on the blouse. And then, you know, I bounce around so I'm letting these sections of paint dry. But, you know, since I'm doing all these individual heads, I'm just bouncing around on all these heads. Please ignore the figure on the top right corner. I messed up royally, so I stopped working on that one. <laughs> that one was beyond fixing with a little dab and water. Yeah, good times. Please give this video a thumbs up if it was helpful or fun, entertaining, all those good things. Share, subscribe, drop me all your questions in the comments section below. Hashtag always be practicing, hashtag practice not magic. And uh, Merry Christmas, and I will see you in the next video.